It's just so nice coming and meeting everybody and making connections with people and actually having a sit down conversation with them, you know, getting contact information and just kind of being seeped in the environment of a bunch of really intelligent, really driven developers. I mean, it's awesome. Good morning, everyone. This is Zhong Wei and Dian Lun from the University of Utah. We are doing research to make heterogeneous computing easier to handle. Today, we are going to talk about our research project, CUDA Flow, a modern C++ programming model for GPU task graph parallelism. This is a project to help you manage the programming complexity of large GPU workload using CUDA graph. Here's what we are going to do today. We will start off the motivation behind CUDA Flow. Then we will present the CUDA flow C++ programming model and dive into the CUDA flow transformation algorithm. Finally, we will present the real use cases of CUDA flow and give the conclusion. Let's start with the motivation behind CUDA flow. Most of us know today GPU has advanced many scientific computing applications to the new level. Take the important machine learning for example. With one GPU, we are able to achieve 10 to 100x speed up over the CPU counterpart. The runtime of one GPU is even faster than the runtime of 40 CPUs. During the time CPU performance gain has largely saturated, GPU performance has begun to grow and continue to scale very, very well, even beyond Moore's law. Specifically, GPU provides a very big advantage in computing massively parallel workloads that incorporate large volume of floating point operation. That doesn't mean GPU is going to replace CPU, but it does highlight the need of heterogeneous computing using CPU and GPU together to achieve complementary performance benefit. And this slide shows you the architectural difference between CPU and GPU. In CPU, we have a few powerful threads and arithmetic um, logic unit, ALU, to compute control flow block very, very fast. On the other hand, in GPU, we have many lightweight thread or less powerful thread to compute large volume of data very fast. With this property, CPU is primarily built for compute-driven applications such as those requiring very frequent control flow and irregular graph computational pattern, right? In GPU, on the other hand, is built for throughput-driven applications such as matrix operation and data-intensive computing. With this power of heterogeneous computing, GPU has enabled a vast success in today's uh, scientific computing applications, such as data science, machine learning, gaming, scientific computing, and simulation, and so on and so forth. There are many ways to program GPU. Most of the time, this actually depends on the GPU you are using. For example, if you are using Intel GPU, you might use SQL. If you are using AMD GPU, you can use OpenCL. For this talk, we are going to focus on CUDA, the Compute Unified Device Architecture Programming Model that is designed to run on NVIDIA's GPU. Specifically, we are going to focus on the new CUDA graph programming model that has received increasing attention and adoption by large GPU algorithms, such as machine learning and scientific simulation. So here I'm showing a simple example, pretty much the Hello World program for learning CUDA. And the program computes the sexy P, uh, single precision AX plus Y operation on GPU. And the problem is you are given two vectors, X and Y, and a scalar A. The job is to multiply each element in X by the scalar A and plus the result with the element, corresponding element in Y, and you store the result in Y. So this is the data parallel program because you can spawn multiple threads from the GPU and ask one thread to compute each element independently. This is done by specifying the kernel execution parameters in CUDA in terms of grid size, block size, shared memory, and the argument you want to pass into the kernel. Finally, you can invoke MVCC, which is the uh, CUDA compiler from NVIDIA to compile this program and generate executable to run on the NVIDIA GPU. The program we saw 
was actually very simple. Um, CUDA was first introduced in 2007, and that is almost 15 years ago. Thing has changed a lot with more demands on GPU. Application have become more and more complicated. Here I'm showing you a task graph of GPU accelerated circuit simulation workload. We are collaborating with NVIDIA Research. So the task graph models a GPU operation in a node, and the dependency between GPU operation can be an edge. And the GPU operation, you can imagine it's just a memory copy from CPU to GPU or the other way around. It can also be the kernel or other GPU function call. So this GPU task graph can be very large. In this example, where we simulate an NVIDIA design, NVDLA, that has probably 10 million um, or 10 billion transistor. It has more than 100 kernels and dependency in our case. And the resulting task graph can take more than 500 seconds even on GPU to finish. And additionally, we need to repetitively ask you this GPU task graph for each of the simulation cycle. And there can be millions of cycles. Another example in machine learning in which we want to run the inference algorithm on large sparse neural network that have you know, billions of parameter. In this GPU task graph, we have more than 1,000 kernels and 2,000 dependency, and the inference can take several hours to finish, depending on the data size. And in most situations, data size is, is infinite. And we know for many machine learning algorithms, once the architecture has been decided, the neural network architecture you have been decided, uh, you have decided, you are not going to modify that architecture, you know, anymore, right? But you want to repetitively run the GPU on the same neural network architecture to perform inference across, across millions of data batches. So the question here is how do we program and run these two large GPU task graph efficiently? One common execution model to run GPU workload is to use CUDA stream. You launch a kernel, by inserting that kernel execution into the stream, they can run asynchronously. This is done by specifying the stream target in the last of the kernel execution parameter, right? And the stream variable is essentially an in-order queue that keeps a sequence of kernel tasks to run. It's like a C++ standard stu queue. The first kernel you insert into the stream will be the first kernel to run in that stream. With multiple stream, you can overlap execution between kernels to achieve kernel concurrency. And you can also specify events between different stream to synchronize those GPU operations at different stream. And this allows you to build a dependency graph using different stream and events. The major advantage of this stream-based execution is that it enables asynchronous execution, so you can utilize better GPU. For example, with multiple stream, memory copies can overlap the kernel execution, right? And individual kernel running on different stream can also overlap. And stream-based execution model is very simple. It's no different than inserting a task into an in-order queue. However, each stream operation such as creating an event, inserting a kernel, waiting for the event, comes with a certain overhead. And this overhead can become significant for many iterative GPU workloads, such as machine learning and simulation. For example, here I'm showing you a, a GPU algorithm that iteratively launches one million kernel for each of the one million outer loop step iterations. At the end of each step, we need to synchronize this one million kernel. And the computational pattern in the inner loop of this one million kernel is exactly the same for each step, right? But this one million iteration of launching kernel through the stream and synchronizing them on the stream at the end of each step of the iteration can accumulate to a large amount of overhead. If you want to build a dependency graph from stream-based execution model, it's actually very tricky because you need to insert explicit events between operations at different stream. So we can force one operation to start before another, op uh, another operation. For example, here I have a GPU task graph. A kernel one has to run before kernel five and also the main copy operation and kernel two has to run before kernel five and this main copy operation and so on and so forth. 
To create a dependency graph for this, you need to explicitly specify the event, uh, recording the event, for example, after kernel one over here, and before the main copy operation to wait for this event to finish. And you have to do this explicitly for all the dependency between different operations. For example, event two, event three, and so on and so forth. But what about a graph like this? This is an example we have seen before as a GPU accelerated circuit, simu a circuit simulation test graph on an NVIDIA design. And this test graph has more than 100 kernel and 100 dependency. It's very complicated. If you want to do this with manual stream and event insertion, you are going to spend a lot of effort on debugging and maintaining the graph. To overcome this challenge, CUDA recently introduced a new execution model CUDA graph. And CUDA graph allows you to specify a very complicated GPU workload, especially the iterative GPU workload, directly in the task graph rather than aggregated stream and event insertion. So you can directly offload the entire graph onto a GPU using just one CPU call. So executing a CUDA graph consists of three parts. So first, you will define an in-memory representation of the task dependency graph, where each node represents a GPU operation, and each edge represents a dependency between different GPU operations. Second, you instantiate an optimized executable graph from that defined graph. And finally, you can launch the executable graph and update its parameter between successive execution if necessary. And launching the executable graph requires just one CPU call, and the CUDA runtime will perform very good scheduling optimization. Compared with stream-based execution, CUDA graph removes quite a amount of stream launch overhead, and the result can boost the performance of many iterative GPU algorithms. So in this figure, we can see CUDA graph um, actually frees up the space by removing the execution overhead of the stream, and this is very beneficial. Uh, for many uh, machine learning workload, um, like I said, because once you decide a neural network architecture, you just repetitively run that neural, neural, ne neural network architecture on the GPU, right? There's no need to insert event stream over and over. Besides, the new uh, GPU architecture, such as MPA100, uh, has a many task graph optimization. And you can find out more details in the white paper, official white paper about MPA architecture in which they have reported up to 4x speed up for certain GPU test graph pattern, okay? There are two ways to build a CUDA graph. Explicit CUDA graph construction and implicit CUDA graph construction. Explicit CUDA graph construction refers to users define a CUDA graph directly using CUDA graph API, such as creating a uh, CUDA graph, creating a kernel node, creating an edge, add a parameters to an existing kernel node, instantiate the executable graph, and launch the graph, synchronize the graph execution, and so on and so forth. Basically, explicit CUDA graph construction is the straightforward method for you to construct a GPU test graph. And there is a one-to-one -one mapping between your application test graph and the corresponding native CUDA graph. Implicit CUDA graph construction refers to the fact you capture a CUDA graph implicitly through an existing stream-based API. And compared to existing, um, uh, compared to explicit CUDA graph construction, implicit capturing is more flexible and require less effort to migrate your existing uh, stream-based GPU code to CUDA graph uh, because you only need to turn the stream to a capturing mode and repeat whatever that has been written after that stream and when the stream is under the capturing mode, every operation you insert into that stream will not launch immediately, but it will be instead captured by the stream to the corresponding node or architecture or dependency in the CUDA graph. And when you stop capturing, it will return a captured CUDA graph. So in this example we have seen before, the only change we need to do is to add a new stream over here uh, and turn that stream into a capture capturing mode. And everything happens after will be captured into the CUDA graph 
when you turn off the capture remote in a stream. So then you can instantiate an executable, executable graph on that capture CUDA graph to launch the, the graph for execution. There is no strict advantage between explicit and implicit CUDA graph construction. It really depends on your application. For example, explicit CUDA graph construction is very good for straightforward graph definition that is identical to your application graph. And the performance of this construction is typically the best because it represents your intention to parallelize your GPU workload. However, it's very tedious to, to program. And based on our experience, uh, if you directly use the CUDA graph API, the, you, you often increase two to 10 X of your code base because the flat parameter structure of CUDA graph API produces a lot of boilerplate code and that is very, very difficult to, to debug and maintain. On the other hand, implicit CUDA graph capturing is very flexible in getting a CUDA graph from existing stream-based code. Uh, however, if that code doesn't exist, you need to, again, manage the concurrency details with stream and event insertion assignment and so on and so forth, right? And the performance of that capture CUDA graph is highly dependent on the stream assignment because the way you assign stream, event, can result in a totally different CUDA graph, right? And this is very, very difficult to adapt your code to new application test graph. So that is the big motivation. Um, the CUDA flow project over here is trying to address this question. How can we streamline the programming of CUDA graph while encapsulating technical details between an application test graph and its native CUDA graph? Before I move on, is there any question from the audience about the motivation? Good, thank you. Feel free to interrupt me if you have any question during the presentation. Now, I want to present to you the C++ programming model for our project CUDA flow to simplify the programming complexity of CUDA graph. Let's take a look at, again, this Hello World SexP example using CUDA flow. Here I have a written SexP kernel and the GPU test graph have five tasks. Uh, two mem memory copy tasks from the CPU to GPU, H to D, X and Y, because we need to copy the data for both X and Y. And then we have a kernel text to launch your kernel SexP kernel. And of course, this kernel has to run before the data is ready on um, after the data is ready on the GPU, right? And finally, we have another two memory copy tests to transfer the data, transfer the result from GPU to CPU. In terms of the C++ code in CUDA flow, there, is, uh, there are only eight lines of code. You create a CUDA flow over here that manage a, a dependency graph, application task graph, and then you can use the method copy to create the memory transfer task from CPU to GPU and also the GPU to CPU. And then you create a kernel task. Given the argument is the kernel parameter and the kernel name and the grid size, block size, and all the parameter you need to launch the kernel. And finally, you can use the succeed and precede method to create a dependency between different tasks. When you finish defining the graph, you simply call the method of flow. And the CUDA flow runtime will spawn the execution, manage all the execution detail for you. Question. Yes. Uh, you mentioned copying from CPU to GPU. Does that mean uh, this program is initiated from the CPU where you are at? And then you send your data to GPU, to have GPU to the job, and then send the result. So the question is, does this model mean you need to instantiate everything on CPU and then you copy the data from CPU to GPU and then you send the data result from GPU to CPU? The short answer to this is yes. And I will talk about the philosophy later. Yes, everything you see over here happens on CPU. We define the graph first and then we manage the transformation, execution detail later. And I will talk about the motivation about this later. Okay, any other questions? Yes. 
Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So to your question, we also support a another class CUDA flow capturer that allows you to capture multiple GPU operation into a CUDA graph. So we leverage the C++ lambda function object to define the class method on for you to capture a series of GPU operation through the given stream argument managed by the uh, lambda function object. So in our example, you can capture the 6 CP kernel using the stream from the argument in this lambda. And if you don't know the kernel execution parameter, especially for those kernel coming from the third party library, you have no idea about how it's going to ask you your kernel. In this case, you can just use their public existing stream based API to capture whatever kernel is running behind. Okay, and of course, there are some restrictions. I will talk about that later. Okay, so CUDA flow capture will automatically perform the optimization such as um, describing and deciding the stream and event assignment to transform this application test graph to a native CUDA graph. And this interface is in fact very expressive and it requires a little understanding about uh, CUDA graph and consider a slightly more complicated test graph like this. Only seven GPU tests and the resulting CUDA graph code can have up to 100 lines of code. And you need to specify all the parameter detail like make a CUDA pitch pointer and CUDA graph no create, CUDA graph no destroy, CUDA graph add kernel nodes and many, many more. Uh, it's very difficult to maintain. And the corresponding code with the CUDA graph uh, has only 10 lines of code. And more importantly, our C++ interface judiciously hide the implementation detail. And this can be very easy to extend to other GPU programming model when they begin to support GPU task graph parallelism, and such as the SQL and OpenCL. Now this slide is actually very important. The design philosophy of CUDA flow is to encapsulate tasking detail of dependent GPU operation using CUDA graph. By helping you build a GPU task graph, manage of load details and clean up all the required runtime storage. We do not simplify kernel programming nor abstract memory or data that require yet another data management or abstraction there. This is a very important decision for us who come from application developer to library developer. It is always interesting and challenging to come up with the right abstraction, but the message we want to deliver here is that we should really think carefully about what abstraction is suitable for what application. And most of the time, not touching data memory abstraction is the right way to come up with the library abstraction, okay? So now I'm going to talk about three major API categories of CUDA flow. Um, those are CUDA, uh, graph construction, graph execution, and graph update. So Graph Construction API lets you create a task graph of GPU operation. Graph Execution API lets you run a CUDA graph without worrying about all the execution details, such as transformation between application task graph to the native CUDA graph optimization, instantiating the executable graph, and so on and so forth. Those are boilerplate code that we can help you simplify the CUDA graph programming. CUDA graph uh, update API lets you update task parameter between successive execution. So this slide shows you some example of graph construction API. You can create a kernel task using the method kernel and pass your kernel parameters to the argument list. Or you can use the method on to capture a series of GPU operation through the given stream into a linear chain of CUDA graph nodes. You can also create a memory operation task, such as manset fill to initialize a block of memory with a given value, and also copy data between CPU and GPU. Keep in mind, we do not come up with the abstraction of data that automatically perform this for you. We ask you to explicitly specify this for us. This is very, very important because many high-performance application developer, they often want a very detailed control into the memory and data layout using directive 
you know, um, programming native programming model like a CUDA or LOSA detail control. So coming up with uh, another data abstraction that automatically handle this data transfer in our case become very, very unnecessary. In terms of dependency, you use the meta precede to create a dependency between two GPU tasks. And this slide gives you some example of the execution API that allows you to run a defined CUDA flow. You use the method of load to offload your CUDA flow to a GPU, and you can specify a continuation condition to run and stop the execution. For example, here you can run the CUDA flow 10x, 10 times, or you can give a stop predicate to tell the CUDA flow to run only five times. When you offload a CUDA flow, there are actually a lot of things happening behind the scene. For instance, uh, we will create a native CUDA graph uh, and instantiate a one-to-one -one mapping between your CUDA flow to the native GPU test graph. On the other hand, in CUDA flow capturer, we ask you to select an optimization algorithm, which will be used to transform your CUDA flow graph or application test graph to a native CUDA graph. This step is required because we need to decide a stream and event assignment for you through the capturing process. And this is a very tedious process that we want to help you. And we will talk about the assignment algorithm data, which we have um, just published in the Europar this year. Yes? Yes, so the question is, when you offload, is it possible to specify the target until you reach the target? That is essentially doable with the second, uh, with this method, uh, offload until, that you can specify the target. For example, here I want to offload this CUDA flow for five times, and you can specify a lambda function object as a predicate. Yes. Yes. So this essentially will transform to a simple while loop. While this becomes true, while this is not true, we will keep running the CUDA flow. So we can utilize this execution, uh, repetitive execution advantage of CUDA graph. Thank you for the question. Okay. So this slide gives you some more example of CUDA graph, uh, CUDA flow update API that allows you to update the parameters of a task between successive of load of a CUDA flow. Each graph construction comes with an overload method to update parameter of a task previously created at the same method. For instance, the kernel method has an overload that takes an additional kernel task created from the method previously to update that task with the parameter in the argument list of the overload. So here, for example, we will update the kernel task with the new grid size two and block size two and new shared memory size and new arguments, okay? So this is the update method. At the time of this presentation, CUDA graph is very restrictive about updating parameters. This may change in the future and because of the abstraction, we have, and they can be easily adapted to this change. For instance, you cannot change the graph topology from an offloaded CUDA flow. This is not allowed. You cannot change the kernel function, but only its parameter. Nor can you change the kernel execution context or the GPU devices on which that kernel has been assigned to. You cannot change the CUDA device to which the operands come from in the memory operation task nor the source target context of the memory pointers. And you can find more rules in the official documentation of CUDA graph API. And some of you know the task flow project developed by our research group. Task flow is a general purpose parallel and heterogeneous task graph computing system that gives you an end-to-end -end solution for expressing your parallel algorithm using task graph. And if you want to learn more, uh, feel free to check out my CPP con talk in the last year. You can also refer to our technical paper published in IEEE TPDS. And the key idea here is you can create a CUDA flow task um, in task flow and you glue it together with other CPU tasks. 
and you can really build a very complicated heterogeneous test graph and incorporate in-graph control flow to describe your parallelism in an end-to-end -end fashion. CUDA graph is advantageous in many iterative um, GPU algorithm, but it also, had, it also has problems. Specifically, creating a CUDA graph is, is not cheap. It's actually expensive, and you better minimize the number of creating CUDA graph. That is, granularity matters a lot in CUDA graph. For instance, in our hardware example, uh, the 60P test graph, which we have one CUDA flow for five GPU operation, right? And this is definitely better than creating five individual CUDA flow and you know each of these five GPU operation is defined in one of the CUDA flow and then you build a dependency. This is very, very bad because creating five CUDA flow in this example will give you a lot of overhead. Okay. So putting together as many GPU operation in a CUDA graph as possible is recommended because it typically gives you a better performance with last CUDA graph overhead. And as mentioned in our design philosophy, we don't manage GPU memory and its context. We are a pure tasking library. We separate data from scheduling. Okay, we do scheduling only. All the data management, memory, context usage is on your own because it's application dependent. We don't want you to, we don't want to force you to use our abstraction. They always come with another overhead. So in this example, if you want to place a CUDA flow on a specific GPU, you need to explicitly scope it to the context of that GPU. For instance, here by default, if you create a CUDA flow, it is under the default GPU context, which is often GPU zero, unless you change the environment variable. You can also scope the device context to another GPU using set device, CUDA set device, or some of the API we provide the scope device over here to place a CUDA flow in a given GPU. So over here, we create a CUDA flow on GPU two. And then all the operation in this scope will be scoped to the GPU, uh, the context of the second GPU, GPU two. If you are using task flow, this is uh, even easier. You can just in place a CUDA flow task using the in place on and give it a sort of specific GPU number. And then this will ask the task flow to create a GPU CUDA flow task under GPU three. Any questions before we move on to the transformation algorithm? So the question is, we mentioned multiple GPU programming. Is this the model for distributed computing that you want to distribute CUDA flow into multiple machine? The answer to this is no. Right now we focus on a single machine. With yeah, with multiple GPU, yes. No, no, right now you can have multiple GPU, yeah, yeah. You can have, uh, for example, depending on the um, machine you have, for example, you can have two GPU, four GPU, and eight GPU, and so on and so forth. And how many cores are in a single GPU? Probably a thousand. thousand. Yeah, probably a thousand. thousand, yeah, yeah. Okay. So this is probably, uh, so to the question was how many cores we have in a GPU? And the answer to this is uh, there can be many, and it also depends on the architecture you have. Yeah, probably the Bitcoin miner is the best person to answer this question. <laughs> yeah, anyway, okay. Any other questions? Good, so now I'm going to hand over the presentation to Dian Lun, and he will talk about the transformation algorithm in CUDA flow capture. All right, um, I'm going to talk about some technical details about CUDA flow and CUDA flow capture and show real use cases of CUDA flow. CUDA flow is an explicit gra uh, graph construction method. Uh, 
it is essentially a C++ wrapper over CUDA graph. That is, you define a CUDA flow, and that is exactly your CUDA graph. It is always a one-to-one -one mapping between uh, CUDA flow and its CUDA graph. On the other hand, CUDA flow capturer is an implicit graph construction method. It captures the graph later. In CUDA flow capturer, there's no way to guarantee to be a one-to-one -one mapping because lots of third-party libraries are now open sourced, like Kublas, Kuspas, or QDNN. You are only allowed to use stream based approach to capture their APIs. So there's a need to transform from CUDA flow capturer to a CUDA graph. So for example, the right figure here is a user defined graph using CUDA flow capturer. N1, N2, N3 here are nodes that represent GPU operations, and each edge represents a dependency between two GPU operations. In CUDA flow capturer, we have our own transformation algorithms to transform from the defined graph into a CUDA graph. So the right figure here is a transformed CUDA graph example using two streams. Here we have two streams, S1 and S2, and we assign N1, N2, N6, N7 into S1, and N3, N4, N5 into S2. The red points here are CUDA events. If we want to have a dependency between different streams, we need to have an event. For example, there's a dependency between N1 and N3 and are in different streams. So here we need to create an event on N1 and connect it to N3. So why CUDA flow capturer is not one-to-one -one mapping? That's because when you transform a user-defined graph, you actually have multiple transformation solutions. For example, the left application graph can be transformed into three different CUDA graphs shown on the right side here using two streams. The first transform graph shown at the right top here assigns N1, N2, N6, N7 into S1, and it assigns N3, N4, N5 into S2. This CUDA graph has four events to connect nodes within different streams. The second um, transform CUDA graph here assigns N1, N2, N3 all the way to the N6 into S1, and it only assigns N7 into S2. The third CUDA graph assigns N1, um, N3, N5, N6 into S1, and assigns N2, N4, N7 into S2. And here we create two events for connections. So since we have multiple solutions for a given application graph, which one is the best solution? Well, the objectives of this kind of transformation problem are first, of course, we want to achieve good load balancing. So if you look at a second transform graph here, there are six nodes assigned into S1 and only one node assigned to S2. And that is very load unbalanced. The second objective is to uh, minimize the transformed CUDA graph size because we want to minimize the GPU memory usage. So if you look at the first transformed CUDA graph, it is quite low balanced. We have four nodes in S1 and we have three nodes in S2. However, there are lots of dependencies between different streams and we have four events. So here, the best solution would be the third transformed CUDA graph. Which, only, which not only achieves load balancing, but also only creates two events. The key challenge of this graph transformation algorithm is that our streams are asynchronous and stateful. Event can only be created by the last enqueued node. So let me give you an example of the challenging part. Let's say we've already assigned N1, N3 into S1 and then we assign N2 into S2 based on this uh, yellow application graph. Now, I want to assign N4 into S2 because we want to achieve load balancing, right? However, we are not allowed to do this because there's a dependency between N1 and N4, and N1 does not have an event that can connect to N4. And since streams are stateful, events can only be created by the last enqueued node which is N3 right now. So if we want to have an event on N1, we need to do it before assigning N3 into S1. That means you must immediately decide whether N1 is an event 
when n1 is assigned in S1. So the takeaway here is that dependency can only be created in a forward manner, not backward manner. And uh, here is our proposed graph tra transformation algorithm. And this algorithm also got accepted by Europa this year. All right? Given an application graph shown on the left side here, what we do is to first perform levelization. So here, N1, N2 are at the first level, and N3, N4, N5 are at the second level. N6, N7 are at the third level. Secondly, at each level, we schedule nodes in a run-up manner. So here, from the lowest level to the highest level, um, we assign N1 into S1 and N2 into S2. At the second level, we assign N3 into S1, N4 into S2, and assign N5 into S1. At the third level, we then assign N6 into S1 and N7 into S2. The final step is to create events based on our schedule result. Since we all know which nodes belongs to which string, we can easily create an event in advance. So let me go through our uh, graph transformation algorithm using right figures. In figure A, we assign N1 into S1. In figure B, we assign, uh, we all know that, sorry, <coughs> Since we know that there is a dependency between N1 and N4, and N4 is in S2. So here we create an event in advance. In figure C, we assign N2 into S2 and N3 into S1. Since we know that there is a dependency between N3 and N7, and N7 belongs to S2. So here we create an event on N3 for later connections. In figure D and E, we assign N4 into S2 and use the events on S1 to construct a dependency between N1 and N4. In figure F, we assign N5 and N6 into S1 and we know that there's a dependency between N5 and N7. N7 is in S2. So here we create events on N5. In our algorithm, um, we further detect and eliminate some unnecessary dependencies. For example, in figure G and H, we know N3 and N5 are both in S1, and N5 is assigned after N3. They are both connected to N7. In this case, we only create a dependency between N5 and N7, because N5 is guaranteed to be executed after N3. There's no need to have a dependency between N3 and N7. So here the transformed cool out graph result is shown as here. We assign N1, N3, N5, and N6 in S1. And then we assign N2, N4, N7 into S2. And here we create three events for this graph. Now I'm going to present two real use cases of cool out flow a machine learning workload, and a circuit simulation workload. <laughs> in machine learning algorithms, um, such as training or inference, uh, you always define a test graph once and iterate different batch size of data to go through the defined test graph. Cooldown flow is especially useful when you have this kind of iterative GPU workload. For example, here we use a cooldown flow to solve the neural network inference graph challenge in 2020 IEEE HPEC. This computation is a machine learning inference workload that uses very large sparse neural network and amnist input data sets to perform inference. Here in our work, we instantiate the cool graph only once and iterate inference across data batches on the same cool graph. Here we also leverage cool flow updates to update graph parameters between successive inference iterations. And here in our solution, a cool flow contains over than 1,000 GPU tasks, including copy weights and inputs from uh, CPU to GPU, and perform sparse matrix multiplication kernels, and also copy, back, uh, copy results back from GPU to CPU, and so on and so forth. Our method is called SNEAK, 
and we have published it in uh, HPEC last year. Here we can compare our work with Google's method called Gpipe and NVIDIA's method called BF. And BF was 2019 champion in this computation. The benchmarks contains um, four neural numbers, 1K, 4K, 16K, and 65K, and three neural numbers, 120, 480, and 1920. Here we use up to four RTS 2080 Ti GPUs to perform inference. The right table here shows overall runtime performance of SNEAK, BF, and GPipe across one, two, three, and four GPUs. In this table, um, each row represents the runtime results of three different layers under given neurons. On the common side, we show different methods across uh, different numbers of GPUs. And here, the bold text represents the best solution on the corresponding benchmark. So as you can see, um, SNEAK outperforms BF and GPipe on almost every benchmark. So here I give you an example on the largest benchmark with uh, 65K neurons and 1920 layers using four GPUs. Our method is two times faster than BF and GPipe. There are the GPU numbers. Our method is also faster than baseline in most neural network configurations. We further compare the performance between CUDA flow and CUDA flow capturer on the exact same machine learning workload. Here, we want to see if our CUDA flow capturer with our transformation method can achieve similar performance as CUDA flow. So here on the left table here is the runtime comparison between CUDA flow and CUDA flow capturer. In CUDA flow capturer, R1 represents our method using one stream. R2 represents our method using two strings, and so on and so forth. As you can see, starting from two streams, CUDA flow capturer achieves almost the same performance as CUDA flow. This shows that our CUDA flow capturer can have very comparable performance to the optimally uh, constructed CUDA graph, that is CUDA flow. The takeaway here is that uh, when explicit graph construction is not possible, for example, you have QDNN or QBlast. CUDA flow capturer can automatically schedule your task for you and have very comparable performance to CUDA flow. By using the same machine learning workload again, here we compare the performance between CUDA flow without update and CUDA flow with update. Here we want to see if we really can reduce the graph construction overhead by using update method. The top pie chart here shows CUDA flow without update. The black plug represents graph management overhead, including CUDA graph instantiation, CUDA graph uh, construction, or CUDA graph destroy. With our updating method, at each batch iteration, we need to recreate a CUDA flow to perform inference on that new batch input. The bottom pie chart here shows CUDA flow with update. So here, as you can see, we reduce the graph management overhead from 70% to 5%. Um, the next news, uh, next real use case of CUDA flow I'm going to talk about is circuit simulation, or say, arterial simulation. And that is a very critical technique for checking the correctness of hardware designs. In RTO simulation, um, we typically simulate a hardware design millions of cycles. And in the design, there are lots of gates, or say RTO processes. A gate can be seen as an operation, and operation can be seen as a task. So if you treat a design as a test graph, this means you are launching a test graph million times. Cooldown flow can be very useful in this case, because again, you define a graph once, and then you launch it multiple times. So here, what we do is to transform a design into a test graph, and then we apply CUDA flow to perform RTO simulation using GPUs. Here is a simple result. This chart compares the RTO simulation runtime on the benchmark that runs one million cycles, which means we keep launching a test graph again and again one million times. <laughs> 
the x-axis uh, represents different number of test benches to be simulated. That means we have more and more work to do. And the y-axis represents runtime in seconds. The blue line represents cloud flow, whereas the red line represents stream-based approach. Cloud flow consistently um, performs better than traditional stream-based approach because the overhead of using stream-based approach becomes significant for this kind of uh, iterative GPU workload. All right, let's hand over to Professor Wang and he will conclude the talk. Thanks. Is it working? Good. So we are going to conclude the talk. We have presented the motivation behind CUDA flow and also present a CUDA flow C++ programming model, including explicit graph construction using CUDA flow and implicit graph capturing using CUDA flow capturer. And CUDA flow, CUDA flow capturer have been integrated to our test flow project and you can check out more detail on this website. We also present the CUDA flow transformation algorithm for CUDA flow capturer and we present the performance of the CUDA flow and capturer on two real use cases, large scale machine learning workload and large scale circuit simulation workload. In the future world, we will focus on integrating coroutine into CUDA flow. And the main motivation here is when you launch your CUDA flow, you need to wait until the CUDA flow finishes. And with coroutine, we can actually do multitasking. The CPU side can continue to do whatever he want, but while waiting the GPU side to finish. And this multitasking we call routine can really give us a re really good performance benefit. And I want to say thank you again for those who are using CUDA flow and task flow. And I'm very grat grateful for tremendous feedback, a uh, useful feedback from all the users. And I also appreciate the support from NSF, DARPA, and Nonfocus. With that, I'm going to stop here. I'll we'll be happy to take any questions. So, so the question, let me repeat the question. The question was, uh, what are the mechanisms and, um, the happening behind event? And what kind of operating system, what kind of uh, mechanism is used to control the event in the GPU side? And this is happening at the GPU. There is no operating system for this, but we do have a CUDA runtime. So it is a runtime, yeah. That's a runtime to manage all this execution detail, for example, launching kernel, creating stream, creating, allocating the storage, or allocating the memory in a global memory, and so on and so forth. Okay. Yeah, there is a runtime, execution environment. So when we build the problem, uh, we will build the, like a regular machine code run on CPU, and also download the machine code to the GPU uh, code. So when the code is like downloaded to the hardware, it will be two sets, right? That's the CPU code and the GPU code. Uh, so the question is, uh, what happens um, when we write a program? Is it going to be a code for CPU and code for GPU? And the answer to this is yes. And typically, you pro at least for, for NVIDIA's GPU using CUDA programming model, you write your kernel code, and you have to compile that kernel code to device code. So that device code is completely different from the one you see from CPU code. that runs on your CPU. So I probably should take one question from online. So, sorry. Uh, there's a few questions online. Uh, the first one from anonymous attendee says, I've really enjoyed the detailed presentation thus far. May I please ask how the speakers have used GPU computation to outperform CPU comp computation? Furthermore, given that a lot of computing happens on the cloud nowadays, do AWS, G Cloud, and Azure have GPU provisions that would allow developers to lean more towards GPU computation instead of CPU? Uh, 
Thank you. Um, so the, I, I think I don't need to repeat the question, right? Because I already repeated it. So the answer to your first question is it really depends on application, and I believe I already presented this before. Uh, we have seen a lot of promise and you know performance. Every time we see the presentation, it's always like 100x speed up, right? And it really depends on application. And GPU is not going to replace a CPU because um, GPU is primarily good for data intensive application. So in your application, if you, if you have a lot of data that you want to compute, that's independently or partially dependent. That is the place where GPU can give you a very, very good performance benefit. However, if you have um, irregular computational pattern that require a lot of difficult control flow, such as graph, computing, increment, incre incrementally updating the graph, or something like that, that require a lot of dynamic control flow, this is where CPU can outperform GPU. So there is no strict advantage between CPU or, or GPU, this all depends on your application. But the message here is um, we, we need to utilize both to achieve complementary performance benefit. And the second question was, I believe there are many ways you can use GPU right now. For example, AWS and G Cloud. I think G Cloud is for Tensor TPU, not for, not for, G, not, not for NVIDIA GPU. But there are many ways you can use a GPU right now. Or you, you can even apply the account from NVIDIA, there's a cloud, I believe. If I have kernels that are vastly more expensive than some other kernel, I would want to discover that in the scheduling somehow so that uh, it could end up earlier in the dependency graph. Or would it be better to split it up such that everything is roughly the same cost, even if I could use those kernels in fewer, in fewer lots? So the question is, if I have a very, very long kernel, is it a good idea to split up that kernel into multiple kernel or multiple operation and build a dependency from there? And I don't have the right answer to this because it, again, it still depends on the application. If that kernel is spending a very, very long time and you observe there are some part of the kernel that can run concurrently, depending on the Runtime values, I would say major. I would say you have to major it. Because launching a kernel also has an overhead, right? It's a micro microsecond scale. And also creating a CUDA graph also has overhead. And it's at a median, mini, mini second scale. At least in RTX GPU. So the answer to this is we have to major and, and, and try to partition it. Thank you. So the speaker just say um, follow up on the second question from the online question, and there is a, a Microsoft Cloud. You can use the NVIDIA GPU, and there will be the talk tomorrow to talk about this. So in your snake um, algorithm, uh, the nodes are considered a custom cost, right? There's no cost associated with them. And the objective is to minimize uh, the event. Is that correct? So, repeat to the question. repeat the question, whether the algorithm in our cloud for capture, uh, whether the question is, uh, whether the nodes are uniform. Yeah, uh, so right now, um, since we are using, we schedule the nodes in compile time, so we assume all the nodes are uniform. And this is actually a very interesting topic. So in the future, we definitely want to have a runtime scheduler so that we can have a, we can detect the runtime, uh, the execution time of each node so that we can schedule nodes at um, runtime. But uh, that's the in, in the future work. Yeah, thanks. So we have a question from online. Yeah, this is a follow-up from the anonymous attendee. They say, more generally, a question to the speaker and attendees as well. Has anyone found a use for CUDA or GPU computation for tasks other than image processing or machine learning? I mean business computation like modeling, financial instruments, et cetera. Thanks again. 
<laughs> so, <laughs> so the question is, uh, is there any um, other application or motivation beyond machine learning or something like that when we talk about GPU? So this is a funny thing I was told today. If you want to give a successful presentation, you better link your presentation to machine learning, whether you are doing machine learning or not. But, but that, 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 that was a joke, but it highlights the importance of machine learning. Right? Because um, if you look at today's scientific computing application, there are many, many applications using machine learning. Of course, machine learning is not going to save everything, but it is a very good technique to enable this data-driven decision making or data intensive application because you can learn from data instead of developing another yet another algorithm or even more complicated heuristic for a particular application. Okay, so that's where, why machine learning is so powerful and very helpful in this case. I think the session is over and I will be happy to take any question from, from here. Okay, thank you.